current uh, program designs are. Um, we've been doing CHP for a long time. Uh, we've had uh, active programs for since the year 2000. Uh, spent a lot of money. The CHP demonstration program is our kind of granddaddy R&D program. And then we've had the uh, performance-based facility, uh, existing facilities program, CHP component, for about six years. Both these programs ended at the end of last year, at, at the end of what we call System Benefit Charge Program 3. We're now in System Benefit Program 4, and we've been given authorization to do a uh, son of demonstration program, and we're still waiting for permission to do son of existing facilities program, but we're working on that. I'll get into that a little later. Um, when we started this concept back a long time ago, the basic question is of an R&D program is, would CHP work? You know, there was some CHP out there, cogeneration, mostly large scale, you know, a few meter turbo plants. Um, not, and some industrial facilities had some CHP um, activity going on. But in general, there wasn't a lot of CHP going on. The utilities didn't really like it. It was kind of expensive, it was new. And so the basic question is, would it work? And that kind of evolved to wall caves. So now it works. Well, how long will it work? What are some of the issues? Maintenance cycles, equipment uh, reliability, persistence of performance issues, how, how much cost it, how much it takes so long to do, all those kinds of questions. So it's been an R&D program asking those kind of generic questions for a long time. I could get into what we did during that time. We approved a whole bunch of projects. And we say we selected projects. That means that 241 <coughs> groups actually sent in a rather long, expensive proposal that kind of results of a major feasibility study. It got evaluated and was actually selected by a review panelists that, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's go ahead and do it. And of those 241, only 123 actually either got installed or are still hanging on by a thread and still going strong. So about half the people that have gone to the point of <coughs> doing a major feasibility study and decided, yeah, let's do it, dropped out. They know why. Why did they drop out? It takes, takes too damn long and it's too damn expensive. Okay, so that's those are the two issues. It takes a long time. Well, the expensive is, well, how are you going to finance it? Now, you can do the numbers, and yeah, it makes sense financially and everything else, but it's not a core function. And whenever something is not a core function, even if it's doing the right thing and you know it's going to pay back money, it's hard to get the people with the checkbook to actually decide to write the check. It's not a core function. It doesn't, it doesn't add to extra capacity in your production. It doesn't make you any more comfortable. It doesn't do a lot of those things that may be a core function of what you're trying to do. It may save, save some money down the road, but it's still hard to get people to write a check for something that, that's that expensive. It also takes a long time. What happens there? What's the implication there? If the person who was really shepherding the project through a facility leaves, there's only about a 20% chance that project's going to happen. Okay? That's the bottom line. It usually requires somebody around <laughs> who likes the idea and is willing to push it for things to actually happen. So that's just what we've learned all those times we've done it. Not to be negative. Gotta show some pictures. Okay, these are some pictures. This is, these are all, these are close projects. Uh, this is uh, Cuba County Regional Digester. We did a lot of digester projects. This just kind of started up this summer. It took us six years to get to this point. Okay. The person who was the white knight for this project actually left but then stayed on in a, in a volunteer role to make sure the project happened, so it actually happened. They turned it on, they got manure in the digester up here, and the digester suffered a structural failure, and now they've got to figure out what they're going to do with it. The digester is not running, it's full of manure. So, the engine is running. <laughs> okay. this, will, this will be fixed. There's, there's, there's two parts on one. This is a great project, but they're taking, di taking manure from uh, at least three farms in the area to a central location. They're providing electricity and heat for the campus there that has um, their um, uh, administration building for the county, a jail, and a nursing home. This is Schenectady, the city of Schenectady Wastewater Treatment Plant. This one also took six years. Just got started up this year. Um, these 
Uh, there were four digesters here where they were digesting the sludge. They were terribly efficient. They leaked like sieves. So we redid three of them, completely relined them, put new covers on them, turned one of them into a gas storage dome, and two, the other two are still uh, digesters. And we're taking the gas out and putting it through a 220 kilowatt uh, generator. It's uh, been running for about seven months. It's been running fine. This actually survived a change in ownership. The city had actually leased their wastewater treatment plant to a private company who came up with the idea of doing this. But then the city decided that they wanted the plant back. So they fired the contracting company that they had hired to run this plant. Uh, hired all the employees because you've got to have people actually run the plant, you know. People actually do it. So now, now they're city employees, and they still managed to go through the project. And now it's out there. This is uh, Clarkson University. Uh, three micro turbines into a combined chiller heater. That's an absorption chiller that also acts as a hot water heater, depending upon whether you want hot water, chill water, both. Um, the white knight left just after the system was installed, so the monitoring system was never installed. So they tell us the systems weren't running great, but we don't know. Because <laughs> if you can't measure it, it didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a great system. They keep telling us it's running fine, but who knows? Um, they never bothered to measure the gas input to the, to the, to the microturbine. So we don't know all the time. And it turns out that they only need about five days of cooling and stuff. Yeah, right, the pasta and how much cooling you can buy. You're doing a system. You're strong there, I know that. If the students are going to jump up, you're going to sign up to shame Tony Collins and the monitor. Please. Send some students up. This is this is the um, this is a 400 kW uh, micro uh, fuel cell that's uh, at a grocery store in Colony. And um, this is Gola Corporation. Um, they wanted to be the first one to have a fuel cell at a grocery store. And uh, when they found out that one had actually been delivered to a Whole Foods over in Massachusetts before theirs got delivered, he had a fit. <laughs> so they, somehow there were some delays in installation at the one at Whole Foods. So this one is actually the first fuel cell installed at a grocery store in the country. Because, um, <laughs> well, you know, sometimes when, when you have a, a girlfriend here and a girlfriend there, you'll mind both of them. <laughs> yeah, that could be too. That could be too. <laughs> Are you telling me something I didn't know? <laughs> okay, this is our story. We're sticking to it. <laughs> this is actually running fairly well from an electric point of view. The, what, the problem that we're having with this one is there is a chiller on the roof that takes some of the waste heat and makes um, chilled water in the summertime, and they've been having some problems controlling the fans on um, that, and so that's been tripping off. So they aren't getting as quite the efficiency that they could, but the, uh, from an electric point of view, it seems really fine. This will handle 100% of the load of the building most of the time, except for the very, very hottest days in the summertime. And in the wintertime, they use the waste heat to keep the snow off the side of the and the load of the building, along with keeping the building warm. That's Cornell. That's a 17 megawatt gas turbine. It has a one just like it right next to it. Um, this is providing, with a first sig accuracy, the, the turbine here, the first sig is that way, um, is providing most of the steam for the, the campus. And a good chunk of, and a good chunk of electricity now, of course, a good chunk of So 34 megawatts. Yeah. They're at the end of a bit of a long radial line, and nice that could be up minimal power. And this was a major reduction in the carbon footprint. This is a good 40-50 percent of the target carbon reduction. We're just putting in. They're pretty coal. They were burning. They were burning coal. They had to run a four-mile gas line. Fortunately, they owned all the property between the plant and the gas plant, <laughs> so it wasn't with the problem right away. But uh, they had to run a four-mile pipeline to supply that. 
We did some other things. Being an R&D program, we did a bunch of other stuff besides just put in hardware. We did a whole bunch of studies. And probably the most important one is this. This is Hughes site. That is, we claim, it, oh, that's our story, I'm going to stick to it. It's the, the largest repository of actual CHP performance data in the world. Nobody's proven us wrong yet, so <laughs> <laughs> Now, the performance program was a little bit different, where the R&D program, the demonstration program, was kind of best effort program. We would give up to like a million dollars or two million dollars, depending upon what year it was and how big a system you were putting in. And it was paid in milestones. And by the time the system got commissioned and was running, you got you'd have all your money. It wasn't, there was no holdback based on performance. As John alluded to a little earlier, the performance program was different. You got 40% of your money when the system was installed, and then the other 60% was paid over two years based on kilowatt hour production. But you also had to meet some other metrics. One, you had to do an emissions test every year. You had to prove you're still clean. You had to um, demonstrate that you were at least 60% uh, fuel utilization, overall efficiency was at least 60%. And if it wasn't, they would take some money away. You also had to pledge to have a certain average kilowatt production during is like 150 special hours every year. It's, uh, May 1 to the end of October, 8 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night, Monday through Friday. And you measure your output those hours and you had to average a certain kilowatt during that time period. If you didn't meet your pledge, you got dinged. Okay, so this was a demand reduction program. This was trying to mostly, it started out as just con ed territory. We expanded it upstate later on, but it was mostly to keep the peak demand, summer demand down in the kind of service territory. Where <coughs> That's what the original justification was for. So it had to be all these requirements in order to get your, your money. And uh, we are still working on some projects. They installed 10 projects all together. Anything that the application we got before the end of the year was still working on. So there's still some projects in the pipeline. This is what we've got here. Now, going forward. Those two programs died at the end of SDC3, which closed out in December, December of last year. They so we had the end in success. They, well, no, <laughs> SDC3 end, SDC3 end. So we had, to re, we had to come up with a whole new plan for SDC4, um, which went through you know, our proposal, and then public comment period, and then another proposal, and another public comment period. And we finally got to the situation where we had proposed two, CHP programs, an acceleration program, and performance program, and they said, okay, the acceleration program is great, you guys can go ahead and here's some money, go ahead and do it, but then they pulled a, a Congress trick. They, they authorized the performance program and didn't appropriate any money for it. <laughs> they said, yeah, do a performance program, but you come back with a proposal on what other programs you want to steal our money from or pay for it. So that just, they just finished the public comment period on where we're going to steal the money from in order to pay for it, and uh, hopefully we'll get a decision from the Public Service Commission by the end of the year for the performance program. But if you remember, the, re the reason for the R&D program for the demonstration was first to determine will CHP even work and then how well will it work and all that kind of stuff. Now the question is, how do you get people to actually buy it? <laughs> how can you design an incentive program, we call it a deployment program, that will actually encourage people to install these systems. Now, we have a lot of experience with incentive programs. We've had incentive programs for residential PV. We test our as an R&D program. It's now a deployment program. We have incentive programs for changing out air conditioners, you know, um, uh, energy smart programs, building performance programs, all sorts of incentive programs to get people to do things. How do you design one for CHP? So that's what the acceleration program is going to be, the question that's going to be answering is how do you actually design the deployment program for CHP? So it's going to be an open enrollment program. So this is going to look like a deployment program. We're going to start off with a model, see how it works. If it works, we're going to fine tune it. If it doesn't work, we're going to try something different. At the end of, five, well, end of uh, 2016, we hopefully will have a deployment 
program that we can move over into the plant people for a lot more money at it and actually get some of these systems installed in a big way. So, it has going to be open enrollment uh, program. There won't be any due dates. There won't be any committee to decide if your particular system is good enough. So we, we fill out an application. If you meet the program requirements, we send you a contract and you can go ahead and start construction. It'll provide incentives for, since it's going to be an employment program, we can't do all of the wide net stuff we were doing before in the demonstration program where someone would say, yeah, I think I want to put an organic Rankin cycle and use the waste heat from burning the sludge at my sewer treatment. We can't do that. It's got to be technology that we know works right? and we, where we can have some hope of driving the cost down. So we've identified pre-packaged, pre-engineered systems. Now, what is that? We started seeing a lot of those the past couple of rounds for the demonstration program where someone would have essentially a box that had an engine in it or a micro turbine or some other technology in it. There was a dump radiator for the waste heat. You've got to have one of those. That was the right size to go with it. There was some heat exchangers that were the right size to go with it. There was a control system that was all set up to go with it. And all you really need to do is to design, is it, decide, is it the right box for the building? And how do I design the interface between, or where, where am I going to put this box in my building? And then how am I going to design the interface between this box and the rest of the building? It kind of becomes a little bit more complicated than putting in a boiler, but that's kind of what we were trying to get to, is that kind of decision level. So we're looking at pre-engineered, pre-packaged systems with known performance characteristics and known, perform and, and known um, persistence of performance characteristics, reliability. We want to actually see operating systems so we can uh, judge these things. We're going to get fairly good incentives at the start. We'll probably drop those over time. We're going to start off fifty to two thousand dollars of KW. Uh, we have twenty-five million dollars available right now. We have a little more than that, but that's what we're telling people we've got. We're going. To, we're currently reviewing about fifty systems. We actually already released the RFI request for information for vendors, and we're currently looking at. Yes. Is your evaluation going to uh, assess their ability to service that equipment? I'll get to that, <coughs> get to that when we talk about the vendor requirements. We're basically going to have a catalog on you know, the website. This will be a list of available equipment. Here's some information about all the, all the pieces of equipment, and there will be a particular rebate attached to that particular piece of equipment. And for situations where we've seen a lot of, like multifamily buildings with between two and 300 apartments, or master meter in kind of service territory, we kind of know what size system fits there, what's going to work. We're going to have a relatively simple application process. If you're outside these well-studied, well-known applications, then it's only, it's only a longer application process. But we're going to try and streamline the application process. We wanted to go up to two megawatts. The other side of the shop wanted to go down to 500 kilowatts. We had an arm wrestle. We decided on 1.3 megawatts as a bright line divide between the two programs. It's arbitrary and capricious. Okay. But if we do anything is less than, if it's the system you're putting in is 1.3 megawatts and less, or and greater than 50 kW, then belong to this program. If it's greater than 1.3 megawatts, it belongs in the hopefully soon to be approved uh, performance program. And again, the incentives we hope will be available in November. Now, we've already got an RFI on the street to vendors. The vendors have to provide a detailed description and performance of their system so we can evaluate it. So we get pretty detailed in, in the information we're looking for. They have to provide some mechanism of providing a five-year bumper-to-bumper maintenance warranty, something or other, some sort of deal. We don't care what that deal is, looks like. It can be a PPA, our purchase agreement, it can be a one-year warranty and a four-year service contract, but it has to cover everything. It has to cover scheduled maintenance and unscheduled maintenance. It has to cover everything for five years at a known price up front. You can pay it a month at a time, or you can put in the cost of the system. We don't care. Any business model you want to do, but there has to be a five-year maintenance warranty package of some sort that we approve. The vendors have to be responsible. Single point responsibility. 
They may not be the company that installed it. They may not be the company that designed the interface of the building. They may not be, um, they, they may, they're the company that put it all together, but they're the ones that we want the customer to be able to call and say the system isn't running right. So the vendor has to be involved in the design process. They don't have to be the designers, but they have to be working with the designers. They have to be, make sure the system was installed properly. They don't have to be the installers, but they have to be working with the installers. They have to be involved in the process because they have to offer a single point responsibility as far as to their customers in selling the system. We're going to be changing the way the dynamics works a little bit because we want this to get closer to buying a car. Okay, you buy a Ford, you buy a Ford, you don't care. You know, if something goes wrong, you're going to contact somebody with a Ford logo on the front and get your car fixed. Okay. Again, the 1.3 megawatt limit has to be greater than 50 kW. We also have some other requirements, such as the system has to be capable of operating if your grid goes down. Okay, so it's got to be either synchronous or it has to be inverter based. No one's actually going to tell you this. It has to be generally in most applications, it has to be make up the 60% uh, fish, overall efficiency. And it had, there's a limit on how much NOx you can produce and everything else, just like you normally do. Now, the performance program. Okay, the performance program that we propose going forward is exactly the same as when we had before. Except that they may not have a limit, they can't be any smaller than 1.3 megawatts. Okay, they're, they're asking for $50 million to the end of 2016, $2 million to the site, 60% um, or 40% when the system gets installed, the other 60% over, over two years of operation, assuming, assuming that the project meets performance targets, just like before. Okay, and again, that's waiting for PSU approval.